Thank you all for coming back. Let's start with a word of prayer. Then. <coughs> Father, thank you for bringing us here today. Thank you, Lord, for the, for the nice weather that the rain stopped for a while and the sun shines out. Lord, may the sunshine of your words shine into our lives. And may the words of your mouth and the meditations, words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be always acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Amen. Part two, the return. <laughs> part five, okay, yeah, part, part, yeah, part five, but part two of Pentecost. And uh, there may even be a part three. What I want to do, you've probably all heard many sermons in your life, and you've probably heard many preachers that choose a text, read their text, and then their sermon has absolutely nothing to do with what the text is. We had a lovely pastor once who, every single text he read somehow ended up on social justice. I, I, I don't know how. I want you to mark the Apostle Paul Peter on his first sermon choice of text to see how relevant it is to what's actually going on in the, the, the thing. So if you want to turn to Acts for me, Acts 2, and we're going to verse 14. This wouldn't have been Peter's first speaking engagement because Jesus sent him out to preach. What Peter and the others would have done would probably be to learn Jesus' um, parables and things word by word and actually preach them. Which is why in later, later life they knew them so well to write them down. So we're doing 14 to 21. I shall read this one. But Peter, taking his stand with the eleven raised his voice and declared to them, Men of Judah, and all you who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give heed to my words. For these men are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. And it shall be in the last days, God, uh, God says that I will pour forth my spirit upon all mankind. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And upon my bond servants, both men and women, I will in those days pour forth my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will grant wonders in the skies above, signs on the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapour and smoke. Shall um, the sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon into blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord shall come. And it shall be that anybody who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Great and glorious day of the Lord. Hmm, that'd be a good sermon to do, wouldn't it? Um, how many of the things mentioned in that verse actually happened on the day of Pentecost? Did the sun and the moon get turned to darkness and blood? Did the sons and the daughters prophesy? And the slaves? Were there wonders in the skies above and beneath? Does it say anything in there about talking about in other tongues? Mark's out of ten for his choice of text. <laughs> You're very wise not to give it. Now we've got two options here. Either Peter was an incompetent preacher, this was his first one, we'll let him off. Or we can assume that the Holy Spirit, who was controlling Peter at this stage, knew what he was doing. I prefer to go by the latter. But when you first look at this, where's the connection? There's one bit of connection, which is the Holy Spirit poured out, that's it. Nothing else. Now there is a clue in the way he puts it. The first thing, he adds a couple of extra bits that aren't in the original. And later on we're going to read the original text from Joel. The very first bit he says, and it shall be in the last days, um, says God says. That's actually not in the original. But when you read the original, it's all about what's going to happen in the last days. So basically he's summarising the whole of the book of Joel in that little phrase there. The other phrase that he adds in there, uh, let's go. it's actually verse 18. Even upon my bond servants, both men and women, that's good, I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. That's not in the original either. That's something he's added on. 
And now the reason he's added it on is not because he's forgotten his text, it's because he wants to emphasise the fact about prophecy. So it starts at the beginning, I shall pour out my spirit and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And at the end of it, he's talking about prophecy. Now what do you regard prophecy as? Hmm. Foretelling. Thus saith the Lord. I, I like a good thus saith the Lord. In the church I grew up in, there was a, fray, a phase when people would go up to the front and go, I think the Lord would say, peace. And then they would rabbit on for ages about what they thought that meant. I, I'm a, either God says it or he doesn't say it. So either I thus saith the Lord, I'm not, but anyway, I'm, I'm stroppy about that. But what does the Bible say prophecy is? Um, I'm, I'm road testing a new Bible today as well, aren't you? And one of the things it says in there about prophecy is it describes the, a prophet as a divine ambassador. Which I thought was a lovely, it, it sums up the job perfectly, a divine ambassador. First prophet in the Bible. Who's the first person described, or it, the first time the word appears in the Bible? It's always in Genesis, it's always in Genesis. Let's go to Genesis then, uh, chapter 20, verse 1 to 7. Which is a strange little one really. My Bible, it's titled Abraham's Treachery. In those days, if a king saw someone who was uh, a lady who was nice and wanted to marry her, and she was always married, there was an easy way. You didn't have to go through divorce. You just killed the person who she was married to, and then you could marry her. It was simple. Abraham came up with a cunning plan to deal with that, but it sort of backfired a bit. So it's uh, 1 to 7. Abraham journeyed from there towards the land of Negev and settled between Kadesh and Shur. And he sojourned in Geha, Gerah. And Abraham said to Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. So Abimelech, king of Geir, sent and took Sarah. But God came to Abimelech in a dream and said to him, Behold, you are a dead man because of this woman, whom you have taken, for she is married. Now Abimelech had not come near her, for he said, and he said, Lord, will you slay a nation, even though we are blameless? Did he not himself say to me, She is my sister? And she herself said to him, he is my brother, in the integrity of my heart, and, uh, and, and in the innocence of my hands I have done this. Then God said to him in a dream, yes, I know that of the integrity of your heart you have done this, and I have also kept you from sinning against me, therefore I did not let you touch her. Now therefore restore this man's wife, for he is a prophet, and he will pray for you, and you will live. He is a prophet. So the first person described, or the first time that word is used, is of Abraham. And yet he's not here saying, thus saith the Lord. In fact, he's lying. Not strictly speaking lying, because actually Sarah was his half-sister. So it was, I, I think there's a term, uh, economical with the truth, I think was an expression in the past. And he, he does this same trick in other places, trying to... Basically, he doesn't get bumped off. Um, but he doesn't prophesy here. In fact, the only prophecy I can think of from Abraham is when he's taken Isaac to be sacrificed. And Isaac says to him, here's the fire, here's the wood, where's the lamb? And he says, God will provide the lamb. That's the greatest prophecy in the Bible. God will provide the lamb. But here, there's nothing about prophecy. But what does God tell him to do? Pray for Abimelech. And when Abraham prays for him, he's healed, these nations healed. So in this sense, the prophet is actually a, an ambassador who said, well, Abraham, pray for this nation. Bring this message to them to heal them. He's been used as a, 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 a mouthpiece of God to bring healing. It's a weird little story, that. Weird little story, that. <coughs> Later in, later in life, they t um, in Hebrews and things, they talk about them being a prophet. Yeah. 
Um, and same with Noah. He was a, a preacher of righteousness in his generation. Um, but I don't think it actually says he was a prophet. It just said he walked with God. But it doesn't actually use the word. So it's often when the word first comes into scripture that it's interesting. And there's lots of different words for prophets. Yeah, it was a prophet. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's, yeah, it's where the word is used and I quite agree with you. Yeah, because we can look back and look at things in hindsight. Um, Let's go to, to um, the story of um, Samuel and Saul. So 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel. Here's an interesting one. Because what is a prophet? Is it someone who just says, he thus saith the Lord? Is it someone who just prays for people? This is Samuel trying to persuade a very reluctant Saul that he wants to be king, or he's going to be king. And... Samuel lays out a whole load of, of things that are going to happen to him to prove that God is actually in this and that this isn't Samuel lying to him, that God's actually behind it. Afterwards, this is verse 5, Afterwards you will come to the hill of God where the Philistine garrison is and it shall be as soon as you come there to the city you shall meet a group of the prophets coming down from the high place with harps and tambourines and flutes and lyres and they will be prophesying and the spirit of the Lord will come upon you mightily and you shall prophesy with them and be a changed man. So are they all coming down saying thus saith the Lord? Or were they singing? It's interesting uh, there's another time the spirit of the Lord comes upon Saul in the same way but in this time he's going to try to kill David. David is hiding out with Samuel as Saul is approaching, the Spirit of the Lord falls upon him and he starts prophesying again. And as he's going along, he strips off all his clothes and he ends up flat, lying flat naked in front of Samuel while David tails it out there. I'm not entirely sure that's a good time to be prophesying, but... So what is this? If this the Spirit of the Lord comes upon you... If we think of the Pentecostal churches where they're all speaking in funny languages... Maybe. Go to Psalms. Oh, sorry, Chronicles, sorry, Chronicles. 1 Chronicles. This is David again, setting, setting the order of the, the, the temple in place. He sets it all up before Solomon actually builds it. So he puts all the, um, the organisation side of it in place. So it's 1 Chronicles, chapter 25. And it's the first two verses. Would someone like to read that for me? Anybody not eating? No one's eating, I'll read it then. <laughs> Moreover, David and the commanders of the army set apart for the service some of the sons of Asaph and of Heman. Um, and, oh, and of Heman and of Death. This is probably why I should have got somebody else to read it. And Jebuthath. Yeah, very wise. Who, who were to prophesy with lyres and harps and cymbals, and the number of those who performed this service was of the sons of Asaph, Zechur, Joseph, Nathan, a lot of other people, <laughs> under the direction of Asaph, who prophesied under the directions of the king. So these are singers, and the singers are prophesying. Now when you think of David and singing, what do you think of? Psalms. Psalms. Let's go back to Acts, let's go back to the, the um, let's go back to the day of Pentecost and let's look at Peter's sermon again. Uh, 25, so it's chapter 2, 25 to 36. And here's Peter quoting from the Psalms. And David says of him, I was always beholding him, the Lord in my presence. For he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue exalted. Moreover, my flesh will also abide in hope, because thou will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor allow thy Holy One to undergo decay. Thou hast made known to me 
the ways of life. Thou will make me full of gladness with thy presence. Brethren, this is Peter speaking, I confidently say to you in regards of the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb was with us to this day. So, because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to give him an oath to seat someone of his descendants upon the throne, he looked ahead and saw the resurrection of Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh suffer decay. But Jesus, God raised up again uh, to him, and we are witnesses. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured forth that which you see and hear. For it was not David, who ascended into heaven, but he himself, and he says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make thine enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let the house of Israel know for a certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. See, he's quoting the Psalms there, songs, and he's saying these are prophecies. Now some weird people prophesied. Can you remember Caiaphas, the high priest? Yes. When he said it's better for one man to die than the nation to perish. And the scripture says he prophesied. Now Caiaphas, Caiaphas ain't one of the good guys. He ain't one of the good guys. But God can prophesy through some strange people. He prophesied through Balaam. Balaam the prophet who was only interested in money really. So what Peter is concentrating on here is the prophecy, the pouring out of the Spirit and the prophecy. Let's go to Numbers. Poor old Moses, once again the people are whining their, whining their heads off. They're hungry this time. Now Moses heard the people weeping throughout their families, each man at the door of his tent. And the anger of the Lord was greatly kindled and Moses was displeased. So Moses said to the Lord, Why hast thou been so hard on thy servant? And why have I not found favour in thy sight, that thou hast laid the burden of all this people on me? Was it I who conceived all this people? Was it I who brought them forth, that, they should, that thou should um, say to me, Carry them, carry these in your bosom, as a, nursing, uh, as a nurse carries her nursing infants to the land which thou didst swear to their fathers? Where I am to, uh, to get meat for all these people. For they weep before me saying, give us meat that we may eat. I am not able to carry this people because it is too burdensome for me. So if you're going to deal thus with me, kill me at once. If I have found favour in thy sight. And do not let me see my wretchedness. He's not in a good mood that day. The Lord therefore said to Moses, Gather to me seventy men of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be elders of the people, and their, officer, and their officers, and bring them to the tent of meeting, and let them take their stand before me. Then I will come down and speak with you there, and I will take of the Spirit who is upon you, and I will put it upon them, and they shall bear the burden of this people with you, so that you will not bear it alone." And we cut over the page to, to 24. And Moses went out and told the people the word of the Lord also. And he gathered 70 men of the elders of the people and stationed them around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him. And he took of the spirit that was on him and he placed it on the 70 elders. And it came about when the spirit rested on them that they prophesied. But they did not do it again. But two men remained in the camp. One of them was Edad, Eldad, and the other one was Medad. So. And the spirit rested on them. Now they were amongst those who had been registered but had not gone forth to the tent. And they prophesied in the camp. So a young man ran and told Moses and said, Eldad and Medad are prophesying. Must have been a cockney. Medad's prophesying in the camp. Then Joshua, the son of Nun, the attendant of Moses, and his youth answered and said, Moses, my Lord, restrain them. 
And Moses said to them, Are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people would prophesy. And the Lord would put his spirit upon them. And Moses returned to the camp, both he and the elders of Israel. There's another part of here. The responsibility for looking after the people, the responsibility for doing the job. God took the spirit from Moses and he put it on these 70 elders. Whether they were worthy or not, interestingly, because two of them couldn't be bothered to leave the camp. Interesting that. But there's another aspect here of the spirit coming on them. Go to Isaiah. I'm going to try my new Bible for this. Isaiah 60, 61. Some of the most beautiful words in the Bible, though they're not quite as lovely as this Bible, but they come differently. <coughs> Isaiah 61, first three verses, and you should recognise them from the life of Jesus. <coughs> the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me, <coughs> because the Lord has chosen me, he has commissioned me to encourage the poor, to help the broken hearted, to decree the release of captives, and the freeing of prisoners, to announce the year of the Lord and to show his favour, the day when our God will seek vengeance, to, con count, to console all those who mourn, to strengthen those who mourn in Zion, to give them a turban instead of ashes, oil symbolising joy instead of mourning, a garment symbolising praise instead of discouragement, and they shall be called oaks of righteousness planted by the Lord and revealed, revealing his splendour. Can you remember when that was said? It's the yeah, synagogue in Nazareth. Jesus speaking to the people. He actually only reads the first verse and a half of that case. But. <coughs> so this is Jesus saying, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. This is the job he has given me. This is the job he has given me. Let's go to Matthew. Chapter 17. And I want you to notice, uh, I think there's a bit of a vibe of Moses going on here. Moses speaking to God that we've just read a little while ago. This is after the transfiguration, after Jesus has spent months retraining his disciples. And he comes back into um, the Jewish area for the first time. And we are 14 to 21. And when they came to the multitude, a man came up to him, falling on his knees before him, saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic, and he is very ill, and he often falls into the fire or into the water. And I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. And Jesus said to them, O unbelieving and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? For how long will I have to put up with you? Bring him to me. Strange thing to say, isn't it, to a, a father? Do you get the sort of vibe of Moses got on, going on here? Who's Jesus annoyed with? Disciples. Yeah, I think it's the disciples he's annoyed with, not the man. Mm -hmm. Now, in another gospel, Jesus has to sort out this. Let's read on a bit more. And Jesus rebuked, rebuked him, that's the demon, and the demons came out of him. Interesting that the man thought he was just ill. Jesus recognised there was a demon problem and the boy was cured at once. The disciples came to Jesus privately and said to him, why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, because of the littleness of your faith. For truly, I say to you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you shall say to this mountain, move from here and it shall be moved and nothing will be impossible for you. Think of Moses. Here's Jesus. The Spirit of the Lord has anointed me. The Spirit's on Jesus. The Spirit was on Moses. <clears throat> Jesus can't do everything. And he knows that he will not be with them forever. So what did Moses do? God do with Moses? Took the Spirit on the 70 elders. What does Jesus do? The Spirit on the 12 apostles. There's another phrase in there that I noticed. Oh, wicked and perverse generation. Did you notice that in there? Mm. No, generation. 
that's got some history in the Bible as well. Let's go back to um, Genesis again. Story of Noah. Story of Noah. In fact, we, actually, we won't even look back at it. You, you should know this one. Hopefully you know this one. I did a little test on the Sunday school children today, and it was a frightening how much they didn't know about the Bible. God looks at the mankind, and he says he, he can see every thought of their heart was evil continuously. And so he decided to bring the flood. But he said that Noah was pure in his generation. So of all those people, he was right. He wasn't perfect, but he was right with God. So you have that beginning right at the end that there's a generational thing. And there can be generational judgment because that generation was wiped out. And Moses was last. So there's an idea of a generation here. Let's go to Exodus chapter 3. This is God talking to Moses at the burning bush. Anybody, got, uh, anybody can speak now? You want to read this for me? But Moses protested, If I go to the people of Israel and tell them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, they will ask me, what is his name? And what should I tell, and what should I tell them? God replied to Moses, I am who I am. Say to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say this to the people of Israel. Say this to the people of Israel. Yahweh, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my eternal name, my name to remember for all generations. Yeah. All generations. You got that generation bit there. It's also a memorial name I've got in my Bible. The, my memorial name. So God actually has other names, but this is His memorial name. This is the the. In fact, the word Yahweh doesn't actually mean I am. It actually means he is, as far as I understand from, a, from my, new, my new Bible. So it actually, when, when they say Yahweh, it's he is. So it's, the, it's the, the people responding back to God. But there's a generational thing going on here, from generation to generation to generation. Let's go to Deuteronomy 32. Song of Moses. This is a weird song. It's not a cheerful one. It starts off well. Listen, O heavens, and I will speak. O earth, the words of my mouth, my teachings will drop like rain. My sayings will drip like dew. As rain drops upon the grass and showers upon the new growth, I will proclaim the name of the Lord. You must acknowledge the greatness of our God, for he is the rock. His work is perfect, for all his ways are just. He is a reliable God who is never unjust. He is fair and upright. His people have not, uh, have not been faithful to him. They have not acted like children. This is their sin. They are perverse and deceitful generation. This is how they repay the Lord, O foolish and unwise people. Is he not your father, your creator? He has made you and established you. Remember the ancient days, bear this in mind. The years are past generations. Ask your fathers and he, he will inform you and the elders and they will tell you. When the Most High gave the nations for their inheritance, when he divided up all, huma all humankind and set boundaries for the peoples according to all the peoples, uh, number of the asse heavenly assembly. Interesting translation on that one. This is this is the Net Bible, New New English test, New English translation. It's an interesting version. This one, for the Lord allotted, a Lord's allotment is His people. Jacob is His special possession. The Lord founded him, in, found him in a desolate land, in an empty wasteland with animals howling. He continually guarded him and taught him. He continually protected him like the pupil of his eyes, like the eagle that stirs up its nest and hovers over its young. So the Lord spread out his wings and took him and lifted up on his pinions. The Lord alone was guiding him. No foreign God was with him. He enabled him to travel over the high terrain of the land. 
He ate of the produce of the field. He provided honey for him from the cliffs and oil from the hardest rock, butter from the herd and milk from the flocks, along with the fat of the lamb and the goats and the rams and the goats of Basham, along with the best of the kernels of wheat and from the juice of the grapes they drank wine. But Jeshurun, that's another name for Israel, became fat and kicked. He got fat and stuffed. And he deserted the God who made him and treated the rock who saved him with contempt. And he made him jealous with other gods and estranged him, estranged him for abhorrent idols. They sacrificed to demons, not God, to gods they had not known, new gods who they had recently come along, gods your ancestors had not known about. You forgot the rock your father and put your mind and put him out of mind the god who gave you birth but the lord took no note took note and despised them because they were sons and daughters angered him he said to them i will reject them i will see what has happened to them for they are a perverse generation children who show no loyalty a perverse generation So this generation thing's going on here again. Let's go to Matthew, chapter 12. This Bible has about that much scriptural text on it and that much notes on each page, so it's a bit of a, a, bit of a pain to follow through. So 30, verse 38. Some of the experts of the law, along with the Pharisees, answered him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered, an evil and adulterous generation ask for a sign, but no sign will be given to them except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Prophet again, you notice there. Just as Jonah was in the belly of the huge fish for three days and nights, so the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. The people of Nineveh will stand up in the judgment of the just this generation and condemn them, because they repented when Jonah preached to them. Now something greater than Jonah is here. The Queen of the South will rise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it because um, she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon and now something greater than Solomon is here. When an unclean spirit goes out of a person it passes through the waste places looking for, looking for rest but when it does not find it it says I will return home to the home I left and when it returns it finds the home empty and swept and put in order. Then he goes and brings seven other spirits, more evil than himself, and he goes in and lives there. So the last state of the person is worse than the first. So it shall be with this evil generation as well. That was the generation that basically rejected Jesus. You have the disciples who believe, you have the, the leaders and the people who follow the leaders who reject them. So once again, we've got a generational thing going on here. We've got prophets and we've got generations. We won't look up the Luke one. Basically, that's Jesus talking about this, ge this generation, this evil generation. He says to them, the blood of all the prophets from Abel to Zechariah, who died between the porch <coughs> and the altar. Uh, that's a story in the book of Chronicles um, where this one of the sons of the priests is complaining about what the king and the people are doing and he prophesies against the king so the king orders for him to be bumped off and they basically kill him and stone him to death in the temple. In the Jewish Bible, Cain is the first person to die. Oh, sorry, uh, Abel is the first person to die, killed by Cain. And because 2 Chronicles is the last book in the Jewish version of the Bible, that's the last prophet who's killed in the Old Testament. So basically, we would say from, from Genesis to Revelation, they would say from Genesis to 2 Chronicles. So what Jesus was saying is the blood of every decent prophet, every man I've sent from Genesis through to the 2 Chronicles who has died will be, this generation will be answerable to it. Gentle Jesus, meek and mild. Yeah, right. This happens at 70 AD when the Romans surround Jerusalem. Once they've surrounded it, 
nobody gets out alive. Anybody who tries to escape, they crucify them facing the city. And then they work their way, when they break into the city, they work their way systematically through the city, slaughtering every man, woman and child they can find. And a lot of them die out in the temple. And the, one of the things they said about Zechariah was when the, the blood came up in between the stones of the temple, you can imagine how much blood was spread in that temple. They said that's the blood of Zechariah who was killed in here. In fact, it wasn't that temple at all. It's a completely different temple, but that's what they would say of it. And so many of the Jewish people were killed in the temple that their blood ran in the same place. So this is Jesus prophesying the destruction of that particular generation and a particularly gruesome end it was too. Now, with that in mind, let's look at Joel, which is the passage that Peter chose to use. So let's go and find um, the book of Joel. Quick look at the enemy. And we're going to read most... In the first, most of the first three chapters. Because in order to understand any passage, you need to understand the context in which it was preached. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. Hear this, O elders, and listen, O inhabitants of the land. Has anything like this happened in your day, or in the day of your father's days? Tell your sons about it, and let them tell their sons, and their sons to the next generation, what the gnawing locust has left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust has left, the creeping locust has eaten. What the creeping locust has left, the stripping locust has eaten. Awake, drunkards, and weep. Wail for the wine drinkers on a corn to the sweet wine that is cut off from your mouth. For a nation has invaded my land, mighty and without number. Its teeth are the teeth of lions and it has fangs of a lioness. It has made my vine a waste and my fig trees splinters. It has stripped them bare and cast them away. Their branches have become white. Wail like a virgin gird with sackcloth for the bridegroom of her youth. The grain offering and the libations are cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests are mourning, the minister of the Lord. The field is ruined and the land it mourns. For the grain is ruined and the new wine dries up and the fresh oil fails. This is an agrarian culture. They live off the land. So when the new shoots were coming up, a swarm of locusts come in and took out the new shoots. They'd gone away, it started to recover again, and a, and a different type came in. Some people say this is the life cycle of the locust. It goes through different stages, Some, at the end of it it can fly and all the rest of it. Um, there may have been different types of locusts, but whatever it was, four waves of locusts came through the land. Each time they thought they'd recovered, the next lot would come in and wipe it out, to the point it was even taking the bark off the vine trees and the fig trees. And as agrarian culture, you're looking at that and going, we are dead meat. We're dead. Did you notice the promise, though, at the beginning of it? Ask your fathers. Tell your children. Tell your children's children. Tell your children's children's children. So there's actually a, a strange promise in there. There will be those who survive. The, your, the Israel will not be wiped out. They're going to be a pretty miserable time, but there will be a remnant who comes through this. So this is something that happened in their lifetime. This massive swarm of locusts. And now, what does the prophet say they should do? Be ashamed, O farmers, wail, O vine dressers, for the wheat and the barley, because the harvest field is destroyed, the vine dries up, the figs fail, the pomegranate and the palms and the apple trees. All the trees of the field dry up. Indeed, the rejoicing dries up from the sons of men. Gird yourself with sackcloth and lament, O priests. Wail, O ministers of the altar. Come, spend the night in sackcloth, O ministers of God, for the grain offerings and the libation are held from the house of the Lord. Consecrate a fast. 
Proclaim a solemn assembly, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land to the house of the Lord your God. Cry out to the Lord, alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is near and it is come as it comes with destruction. For the Almighty has not uh, has not food been cut off from our eyes, gladness and joy from the house of God? The seed shrivels under the clods, the storehouses are desolate, the barns are torn down, for the grain is dried up. How the beasts groan and the herds of cattle um, wander aimlessly, there is no pasture for them, even the flocks of sheep suffer. To thee, O Lord, I cry, for fire has devoured the pastures in the wilderness, the flames have burnt up and the trees, uh, trees of the field, even the beasts and the fields pant, for the water brook dries up, the fire has devoured and the, the pastures of the wilderness. So what you're supposed to do with this disaster is to go to God and to wail and lament, and also to repent. Then on to chapter two, I won't read it all. He takes the idea of this invasion. Can you imagine this swarm of locusts coming to you? You can see on the hill, you can see the hill getting darker as the hill as the locusts come over the top. And then he goes forward to the future. So it's chapter two. Blow the alarm in Zion and sound the alarm in my holy mountain. All the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord is coming. Surely it is near, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. As the, draw, as, um, as the dawn is spread over the mountains, so are, my great and, so are a great and mighty people. Not, not locusts, people. Army. Army, yeah. There has never been anything like it. There will never be anything like it again in all the years of the generations. A fire consumes before them and behind them a flame. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them and a desolate wilderness behind them. Nothing at all escapes them. He's now taking what has happened with the locusts and saying there will be coming a day when an army of people will come like this and it will sweep across the land and you won't be able to hide from it. There will be nothing left. You can't hide in a house, you can't hide in the mountains, they will just sweep you away. This is the judgment upon you. What were the priests told to do? To weep in sackcloth. Why? Why? Uh, chapter tw uh, verse 12, let's go to 12, verse 12. Here's the prophet's message to the people, to this generation. Even now, declares the Lord, Return to me all of you, with all of your heart, with fasting, with weeping, with mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. Now return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, a bounder in loving kindness, and relenting of evil. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, even a grain offering and a libation, for the Lord your God. Blow a trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, proclaim a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and the nursings, nurslings, let the bridegroom come out of, the, uh, out of her room, or bride, the bridegroom come out of his room, and the bride out of her bridal chamber. Let the priests of the Lord and the ministers weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, spare thy people, O Lord, and do not make thine inheritance a reproach, a byword amongst the nations. Why should they call? Uh, why should they among the people say, "Where is their God?" So that was the message. There's been an invasion of locusts. You've seen what it's like. There was an invasion of people coming. In terms of biblical history, at that particular time, that was the Babylonian invasion. But he's now looking forward, and Paul, uh, Peter is also looking forward, and he's looking forward to what Jesus warned them about, which was the Roman invasion, which would sweep everybody away. So he's taking this passage and saying there's another invasion coming, and you've got to be ready for that. Are you willing to repent? Cold-headed 
idle. Could be. Energy. Could be. Yeah. I suppose it could be. I haven't thought of it like that. Mm -hmm. the, certainly the final one calls them away. Let's go to verse 18. So chapter 2, verse 18. The Lord will be zealous and his, um, for his land, and he will have pity on his people. This is after repentance, if the people have repented. The Lord will answer and say to his people, Behold, I am going to send you grain and new wine and oil, and you will be satisfied and full of them. And I will never again make you approach amongst the nations. And I will remove the northern army far from you and will drive it into the parched and desolate land and the vanguard into the eastern sea. This is what often happens to locusts as well. They get blown, the wind blows them away. And the rear guard into the western sea. I will stretch out with, uh, and its stench will arise and its foul smell will come up for it has done, uh, for it has done the, the great things. Do not fear, O land, rejoice and be glad, for the Lord has done great things. Do not fear, beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness has been turned green. For the trees have borne their fruit, and the trees and the vine have yielded in full. O, son, uh, o rejoice, O sons of Zion, and be glad in the Lord your God, for he has given you the early rain for your vindication. He will pour out on you um, the rain for the earth. Uh, um, the early and the latter's rain as before and the threshing floors will be full of grain and the vats will be overflowing with new wine and oil and I will make up for the years that the swarming locusts have eaten and the creeping lotus of uh, stri strip stripping locusts and the gnawing locusts and the great army which I sent amongst you and you shall have plenty to eat and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you then my people will never be put to shame. Thus you will know that I am in the midst of Israel and I am the Lord your God. There is no other and my people shall never be put to shame. Can you remember when Moses, the second time Moses went up into Mount Sinai, the, he'd come down with the, the, the tablets, caught them with the golden calf, smashed the tablets, um, dealt with a few people, put things in order, and then God said to him, cut out a second set of tablets and come up to me. And Moses basically goes up again, and God appears before him, and he proclaims his name. And he says, I, I, I'm the God. I will have mercy on thousands, but I will have vengeance on the generation and the sons of that generation and the sons of that generation and the sons of that generation. So God proclaims his name, saying, but mercy on one hand, just vengeance on the other. And Moses then bows down and begs for mercy for the people of Israel, for that generation. And God gives him mercy for that generation. Now it has to be said that mercy doesn't last particularly long, because by the time they get from Sinai to the Promised Land, they go, we can't go in there, they're too big and scary. And that's when God basically says, okay, You've had your second chance. Forget it. You've had your second chance. Well, that, by that stage, it was more than a second chance. I think there was at least ten incidences of rebellion before that. Let's go to Luke 13. Luke 13. Think of Jesus. Think of Jesus being rejected by that generation of that day. What would his father be thinking? What would God say about that generation? It's Luke 13, 1 to 9. Now on the same occasion there were some present who reported him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. He answered and said to them, Do you suppose these Galileans were greater sinners than all the Galileans because they suffered this fate? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will likewise perish. Or you, do you suppose the, uh, the 18 on whom the Tower of Siloam fell and killed were worse culprits than all the other men who lived in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will in likewise perish. And he began to tell them a parable. A certain man had a fig tree 
which was planted in a vineyard. And he came to look for fruit, and he did not find any. And he said to the vinekeeper, Behold, for three years I have come to look for fruit from this tree without finding it. Cut it down. Why does it even use up the ground? And the vine dresser, he answered him and said to him, Let it alone, sir, for this year too. I will dig around it, I will put in fertiliser. And if it bears fruit next year, fine. If it does not, cut it down. Think of this as the, the owner being God and the vine dresser being Jesus. Here's Jesus saying, Yes, this generation has not produced fruit. It's not produced fruit. Give it another go. Let me have a go with it. Let me dig it. Let me fertilise it. Let me prune it. Let me do everything to it. If it fails, cut it down. This is the same principle as Moses begging God for forgiveness. This is Jesus begging God for this generation that's about to crucify him to be given a second chance. What's happening at Pentecost is that second chance. God is, if you look at the, the words that Peter uses, he's basically saying to them, you are a wicked and perverse generation. What you've got to do, you've taken the Messiah, you have killed him. There is destruction coming. Destruction in this case from the Romans. What you've got to do is what Joel said. You've got to put on sackcloth. You've got to weep between the porch and the altar. The high priests have got to be there. The leaders, all the people. You've killed the Messiah. If you weep, if you repent. What did God promise in Joel? That he would bring blessing. He would bring back all the things that have been taken. He will leave you with a blessing. Here's your second chance. Take it. Take it. There's a problem with being God. It's called omni omniscience. Omniscience means you know everything. And God knew perfectly well, even when he was making that offer, that it would be rejected. Let's go to the passage in Joel again. Let's go to the bit that Peter's text. And with all that in mind, I now want to read this out to you. Okay. Uh, back to Joel, sorry. Um, Joel, chapter 2, 28. Now, with all that in mind, we now read this. This in the, the prophetic thing is after repentance. This is what happens after repentance. And it will come about after this that I will pour out upon all, my spirit upon all mankind and your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on the male and female servants I will pour out my spirit in those days. And I will make wonders in the sky. And on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke, the sun will turn into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And, I, and, it, and it will come about that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be delivered. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there are those who will escape. As the Lord has said, even amongst the survivors whom the Lord has called. Did you see that last bit in Peter's sermon? Wasn't there, was it? You missed out that bit. The word survivors there uh, can also be translated the word remnant. And my nice new Bible here includes the words, those who escape from slaughter. Those who escape from slaughter. What was the prophecy in the beginning of Joel? Tell it to your children and your children's children and your children's children's children. There will be a remnant who survives. So here's... The Jewish audience who heard this would have known the rest of it. And their, their rabbis and their priests would have told the people this. We have to repent and then the Messiah will come. And here's Peter said, look, the spirit is falling. This is what it could be like if we repent. If we weep. 
If you weep between the porch and the altar and say, yes, we have killed the Messiah, then he is willing to forgive you. If you don't, because that's what this was about, if you don't, then that army will turn up. In the case, this particular case, that was the Roman army, in the case of Peter. This book in Joel, though, is something more. This is about a future army. A future army that starts off at a place called Armageddon. And it heads to Jerusalem. And that is when this will come true. When eventually the people of Israel, in their last resort, repent. And they do weep. And they do mourn. And that is when God turns the tables. So in this here, there's four armies really here. You've got your army of locusts, you've got your army of Babylonians, you've got your army of Romans, you've got the army of the Antichrist. All in this one passage. God can do it quite well really, because they're all in there. Let's go to Luke. How long have I got? Ooh, not long. Luke 21. In fact, I'll, I'll tell you what this is. This is where Jesus says to his disciples, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, run away. At the time of the Roman invasion, the Romans surrounded Jerusalem. They then very quickly realised it was stronger than they thought and their su supply lines were a bit weak. So they, they retreated back for a little while. The Christians remember Jesus' words. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, run away. They saw the Romans go away. They went, right, run away. And so all the Christians were led out en masse, crossed over the Jordan into, um, into what we call Jordan nowadays. And so when the Romans came back shortly after and surrounded, there were no Christians left in there because they followed the instructions of Jesus. Because they were the remnant who followed the instructions of Jesus. They repented, they did what they were supposed to do. The, the Zechariah passages, that describes the final battle, that describes this final attack on Jerusalem, where they're overrun and there's a small remnant left. And when that remnant eventually, let's go to Zechariah 14, we'll do Zechariah 14. So Zechariah 14 and 4 to 9. This is, well, in fact we'll, we'll read the whole of 14. Behold, the day is coming of the Lord when the spoil will be taken and divided amongst you. And I will gather you all the nations against Jerusalem to battle and the city will be captured and the houses plundered and the women ravished and half the city exiled, but the rest of the people will not be cut off from the city. So that's the, the remnant that are left. And the Lord will go forth against those nations as when he fights in the day of battle. And the day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives and in front of the city, which is in front of Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives will be split in the middle, and the east and the west, and a very large valley, so that the half of the mountain will be moved towards the north and the other half towards the south, and you will flee by the valley of my mountains, and the valley of the mountains will be reached to Azel. Yes, and you will flee just as you fled before the earthquake in the days of Isaiah, the king of Judah. And the people, and the Lord, my God, will come, and all his holy ones with him. And it will come about in that day, there will be no light, and the luminaries will dwindle. And the unique day, a day known to the Lord, that neither day nor night, and it will come about, and in the evening there will be light. Signs in the heaven above, signs on the earth below. This is the day that that Joel prophecy talks about. This is the second coming. So what Peter is doing in that, in that he's taking something they understand, saying something they know, and say to them, you need to repent. If you don't repent, judgment will fall. If you do repent, blessings will come. And that's what this whole passage is about. So when he's talking about it, it's not the big signs on that day. God knew what would happen. 
And what happens is this. They're given the second chance. And so for the first eight chapters of Acts, the Jewish people are given the second choice. That second chance ends when they kill Stephen. Another person who preached too long. The longest, longest sermon in the New Testament. If you look at that sermon, what's it about? It's about, along came Moses, you rejected Moses and yet he saved you. Along came Joseph, you rejected Joseph, but he saved you. And it's all, a list of all the people that they had rejected. And yet that was the saviour. And what did they do at the end? They stoned him to death. The same priests who had condemned Jesus condemned Stephen. And then that fig tree is doomed. The axe is laid to the root of the tree. It's doomed. There will come a future generation. A future generation of Israel that accepts. And that is when the blessing will fall. So that is why that particular passage is chosen. I chose Philippians to end with. Let's go to Philippians. It's a lovely, lovely passage. The Isaiah section I've, I missed basically says, God has sworn that to me every knee will bow. Every knee will bow. It's 2, 1 to 11. i put it in because it's a lovely passage. If therefore there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation in love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any uh, affection and compassion, make my joy complete and be of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do, do nothing out of selfishness nor empty conceit, but with humility of mind, that each regard himself, regard others more important than himself. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interest of others. Have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in existence in the form of God, did not regard himself as equal with God, a thing to, equality with God, a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taken on the form of a bond servant, being made in the likeness of men, and being found in the appearance of man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. Therefore also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him a name above every other name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess Jesus Christ <coughs> is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's the Spirit fell. Prophecy came. Repent. Repent. And the promise will come. Reject it, judgment will come. And that is what is going on here. Peter actually says to them at the end, um, one of the last things he says to them, save yourself from this crooked and perverse generation. And what he says to the Jewish people is this, repent as individuals, repent, be baptised. Baptism to the Jewish people meant aligning yourself with something. If you were baptised in the name of Jesus, you were thrown out of Jewish society. You were chucked out of the synagogues. And what he said to them, be baptised. Be thrown out of that perverse and crooked generation. Because then the judgement won't fall on you. Mark's out of ten for his choice of text. Sometimes there's a lot more in it when you look at it in context. A lot, lot more in it. Sorry, I've gone on far too long again. No, thank you, Steve. Thank you, thank you. Uh, the, the passages I've missed, and I've missed loads, you can take a look at later on. Okay, so. one of these things, especially Joel. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, when you read it in context, yeah. it's... Yeah. Yeah. We'll finish with a word of prayer then. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you that you are a merciful God who extends mercy to countless thousands upon thousands. Lord, help us in this world to spread your word, to be your prophets to this world, to be your divine ambassadors. 
to warn them of the things that are coming, but to show them the way out. Lord, be with us and strengthen us. Amen. Amen. Any questions? Sorry, I rushed through an awful lot there. Uh, very, very wise, very wise.